At one point, you know that biopics became a pandemic. But not all biopics promise neither revenue nor critics' acceptance. And this has nothing to do with the person on who the film is based on. Movies like Diana, Trumbo, and Grace of Monaco are great examples. Today, we're analyzing two incredibly similar and yet very different films that deals with the same character, Stephen Hawking. But before we begin, consider these extra references as valuable information. Although both were met with favorable reviews in their respectful audiences, Peter Moffat's screenplay didn't met up quite the same hype as Anthony McCarthy's, whose script went on to compete at the Academy Awards. So what exactly can Hawking film teach us about bettering biopics? Here are some interesting points we consider were lacking if not an actual problem in Moffat's version of Stephen's life. First off, let's take a look at the similarities between these two films. They both feature a croquet scene, Penrose explaining his theory which later influenced Stephen, We had the May Ball, the doctor's visits, the aftermath of ALS. Both films feature Wagner at some point, and they even had Adam Gottlieb, who played Stephen's father in an earlier version, who's now playing the doctor in The Theory of Everything. So off the bat, you get where I'm going. And yet these two films cannot be any more different. Let's begin. The most important thing to consider when making a biopic is aiming at the right theme. Sometimes drawing out the most interesting and compelling moments of someone's life doesn't always cut it. We have to use our main characters to drive us to a focus point that deals with other themes that would further interest audience. Let's take the king's speech as a brief example. It was not just about the king's life. It could have all been about the friendship between Lionel and George. But it was more about a man who stutters, a man that just so happens to be a king. This same applies to the theory of everything. On the surface, it's just another romantic drama that happens to feature the relationship between Jane and Stephen. But deep down, it's actually about how beautiful life can be despite the hardships. These films have multiple themes and they use the characters and their relationship as engine to convey them. So although we think this step is quite redundant at times, getting this wrong often meant that the whole movie is bad in itself. In John Lisi's article written for Pop Matters entitled A Re-Examination of Cinema's Least Interesting Genre, he suggested there are two types of biopic, one based upon an event, the other based upon a lifespan, and in it he urges filmmakers to make more of the former ones rather than the latter. Of course, he isn't making any wrong assumptions, but we argue that this is not always the case. By getting wrong the themes, it doesn't really matter if a biopic is based on an event or lifespanning. It's still a bad film. Diana is a great example. It made the impossible love a predominant theme while every other seemed just another villain. This is the same to Hawking. The biggest issue with Moffat's version is thinking science can interest people in a biopic. He had opted to tell theories rather than conveying an emotional theme. By framing Stephen's life from his school years up to the moment he decided to marry Jane, we lose all the interesting and exciting part of his life, and this would otherwise work for him had he made the other themes more pronounced than just another thing the film needed to cover. It is at this point where McCartan's script die first. Um, it, it was always a, a three-threaded narrative, and it was always going to honor the science, and okay. I do honor the science. I just, I'm not heavy-handed with the science. Mm -hmm. And I decided early on that, that I wouldn't have physicists explain physics. You can Google that. Right. What I wanted was to find entertaining cinematic ways for lay people like ourselves to say, well, what's the... It is likely that Moffat had also set out doing the same thing. Otherwise, we wouldn't have glimpses of courtship where Stephen and Jane were seen going out, as well as Stephen's deteriorating physicality and his theories. But in the end, Moffat's film never really settled properly on any of them, which made the film incredibly confusing. 
Suffice to say, Jane only appeared 11 times throughout the film, whereas in McCartan's film, Jane appeared almost every scene. In an interview with Telegraph UK, Moffat said when asked about what do you most want viewers to take away from the program, it would be great if our film helped them think first about the amazing thing he's done for science. Then if such is what he aimed for, that is what we got. But with such theme in mind, it should never have become a motion picture, but rather better remain as paperwork or written essay. In Moffat's film, it only reinstated the fact of how Hawking was a brilliant man, but the film could easily be passed as a bad documentary. That said, the entire film had very few to none character arcs. The whole film had wrong inserts where characters like Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson were seen discussing about how Hawking's theory helped them develop their own theory. There were at least eight scenes scattered throughout, and they were not only awfully placed, but they cut the audience's mood and attention. We suppose they were meant to remind us of Hawking's brilliance. Nevertheless, though, they were all sincerely quite boring. And moreover, it's hard enough to understand Hawking's black holes under two hours. Imagine Penzias and Wilson's cosmic microwave background radiation. Science isn't theater. Moffat didn't really structure nor frame its scene nor sequences quite as good as film had hoped for. And the sudden cuts between Hawking's illness to scientific theories without giving audience the time to even process his sorrow over his illness made this film incredibly unemotional which is the core of almost every biopic. If we can't find empathy nor interest with the characters, why are we even watching them? And if you guess that they've actually inserted a Penzias and Wilson scene just after Hawking's awful diagnosis, you are very correct. The theory of everything, on the other hand, were able to get under the audience's skin by completely involving us with Steven's struggle. And although McCartan also did the lineal timeline, like Moffat did, showing us from early on how different and special Stephen was, the film quickly takes you under that surface layer and made us discover how ordinary he really was. Through watching his friendship with Brian and his professors, as well as his body slowly losing itself, such as the scene where we see him crawling up the stairs to comfort Robert, it immerses audience into his agony. It is a gutting scene for any parent. This is how we as audience can actually connect to how devastating his illness really was. Moffat also had scenes similar to this, but they don't quite make up the same chills. A shoe tying scene, a key turning moment, doesn't quite cut it. Of course, this would have been easy to fix had Moffat not cut away halfway into Stephen's life. He would have had the same advantage as McCartan, exploring all the ups and downs to a marriage that failed, but back to the same. Theme matters, and it matters a lot. In what Moffat decided to convey only to the elites of Science Club, McCartan decided to go for a more universal terminology, where everyone not only understood, but felt, which was the power of love and the thriving human spirit. Introducing characters and conflict The one thing that separated Moffat and McCartan's work is the way they presented their main character. Stephen was widely known for his wittiness as well as his deadpan jokes and McCartan set out exactly to capture that side of him. Whereas Moffat leaned more towards the realistic Stephen, the man that were sometimes cruel to others, thinking he might be better than his colleagues. Your calculation is wrong. There are no real flaws in doing so. But having said that, Moffat's intention could have been met indirectly, rather than made up an entire elaborate scene where Stephen would call out on his teacher and correct their theories in front of the students. This risked our sympathy and empathy for him. There was a line in McCartan's version that didn't end up in the final cut. At page 32, when Jane tries to cheer Stephen up by making him teach her croquet, Stephen had initially mocked Jane in the process, prompting her to threat him. Imagine if such line had been left in. Can we then felt the same for Stephen? Perhaps we still might, but it's a risk. A risk that maybe filmmakers thought was unnecessary and time-consuming. But we praise McCartan for choosing to deliver a Stephen that uses more humor to compensate the lack of emotional release. And this brings us to another interesting topic, which is the introduction of conflict. Throughout the theory, Stephen's symptoms were chopped up, scattered into different scenes, whereas we've mentioned scenes where other actions and themes were taking part. Take this one as an example. We have here where Stephen's discussing about the topic of his thesis. And as we can see, it took him a much effort to pick a pen up. 
This not only informs audience, but it also gives us time to process not only the progress of Stephen's illness, but it also gives the film an overall congruity, thus hitting two birds with a single stone. And like this scene, there are many others. In Moffat's version, however, he would allow a single subject to take over the whole of a scene. That is, if we're talking about the illness, we're only talking about the illness. If we're talking about theories, we're only talking about theories. And if we're talking about, you get the point. Every scene needs to hint us, be relevant, and assist the next one, so to create a logic structure throughout the film. Obviously, the theory of everything isn't a perfect film. It does have its flaws. Christy Lamar from Roger Ebert said that the theory of everything was told in the safest and most conventional method imaginable. But we argue, nevertheless, one walks out of the theater feeling as if Hawking not only gave science a great advantage, but also the thriving strength of a human spirit, which is what most should praise about this film. As said in director James Marsh interview, I was really drawn to that because it feels like there's so much instant gratification in our lives, and there's so much sort of, you know, sort of almost you know, pornography is one click away on your computer, and then to have this relationship that has such sort of subtleties in its seduction and the courtship felt really interesting in the modern age. It's a generation that's older than mine. It's a post-war generation in in England. All these aspects should sum up the true value of the theory of everything in our modern cinema. There is something truly inspiring to hear the effort of a screenwriter. Just keep going. I mean, I'm 53, and I've been sort of doing this since I was about 23. So, I mean, that's 30 years. Instead of pointing out and say they don't add anything to modern art these days, what films really do? I really enjoy biopics. In fact, they are one of my favorite genres, and I'm glad they're making more of them. But we do encourage filmmakers to take another perspective on biopics, as they can also be introduced in many different ways. Sometimes they take forms of a thriller. other times as a window into a forgotten era. So we need to be creative. Biopics doesn't need to be reinvented. It just needs another perspective.